When was the last time you had a goal blocked? Often when we think of, of that idea, it's done in sports terms. I remember watching uh, the, the Seahawks play. In fact, I think it was might have been even in one of the Super Bowls, and the opposing team was uh, lined up to kick a field goal, and one of our guys took the most amazing leap, went, leapt over the rest of his comrades and jumped up and blocked the shot, blocked that goal. There's a lot of effort sometimes that goes into blocking a goal. And it feels great when you happen to be playing defense. But what if you're on offense? What if if you're trying to accomplish a particular thing and that goal gets blocked? It can be very, very frustrating. And frankly, the games we watch aren't nearly as important as the life we live. So what happens when a goal that we have in life gets blocked? Now, uh, I want you to know, many of you already know this, but some of you might not, that I don't plan these sermons a week in advance. I plan them about a year in advance. I go away every year in October, and I kind of read like crazy for two or three days, and I sketch out in very broad terms what I want to preach on for the next year. So I had no idea when I planned all of this out that I would be exhausted from doing two weddings, um, that the goals that I personally had planned for this weekend didn't get met, and I didn't realize that I would be preaching this to myself. So I will try to have this not be very inward and focused and try to make this as generic as I can. But I want you to to realize right up front, uh, you're not on the hook for this, okay? I feel, I think many of us feel generically, but I I certainly have felt frustrated by fruitlessness, especially recently. Recently. And there are some foundations to that that show up in the text and were very helpful for me to remember. So I'm going to remind us what these are. Foundations for frustration. And we're going to start by looking at Matthew chapter 21, and we'll start at verse 12. In your Bible, that's on page 1532 in the Pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 21, and we're just going to look at 12 and 13 to get us started. This is uh, Jesus um, getting ready for the, the passion. He knows that he's headed towards the cross, and so he goes into Jerusalem. This is right after the triumphal entry in Palm Sunday and all of the palms waving around, right? So he heads to the temple area, Verse 12, and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. One of the foundations of frustration is putting the wrong things in God's place. Putting the wrong things in God's place. In fact, uh, specifically in the court of the Gentiles, if you've ever seen a a picture or a map kind of layout of what the temple looks like, you have the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's a fairly small little rectangular room. And then there's a, a larger rectangular room that has that smaller one inside it, and it just gets a little bit larger. That's the holy place. And then you have the exterior part of the temple and then you have the the part where the actual altar is where the offerings are made and off to the side you have a court of the men and then a little bit farther away but not very far you have the court of the women and then there is a little wall it's about this tall from here not from there so it's it's only about two and a half That little two and a half feet tall wall had a warning on it for everyone who was not Jewish. They would be uh, in big trouble if they crossed that wall. Everything on the outside of that wall is called the court of the Gentiles. And when um, King Herod rebuilt the temple, he really expanded this court of the Gentiles. So it's it's a huge area, still part of the temple, the court of the Gentiles. And why Jesus is so frustrated when he gets to the temple area and he drives out all who were selling there is that the people who were in charge of overseeing worship had decided 
that it was more important to make money selling animals than it was to make room for people who needed to hear about God. For them, profit was more important than people. And that's a problem. They were putting the wrong things in God's place. The specific place that was there was reserved for Gentiles, for you, for me. That was supposed to be our spot. And actually, it's a very old idea. King Solomon, all the way back at the dedication of the second temple, hundreds of years before, prays in his dedication prayer, Lord, there's going to come a time when some foreigner in a far-off land is going to be in a lot of trouble. And they're going to turn to you and say, God, what am I going to do? When they turn to you, Lord, hear their prayer. Draw them to yourself. Because there was no room in this court of the Gentiles, it was filled with animals instead, Jesus got very upset. The religious elite would rather use that space to line their own pockets than to make space for people. Of course, frustration results. Let's look at verses 14 through 17. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Another foundation for frustration is refusing to credit the work of God around you. Refusing to credit the work of God around you. Now, whether we like to admit it or not, God is at work in his world. What's the old hymn? This is my father's world. It's not my world. Sometimes I think it is. A lot of times I live like it's my world. But it's not. It's my father's world and he is at work in it. And it's my goal, my ideal, to join him in whatever he is doing. But a lot of times I'll want to take that credit for myself Oh, I'm such a great leader. Oh, I'm, I'm doing such a good job. No. It's God's work. The people here in verses 14 and 15, the, the, the religious elite, they are offended by the presence of the needy, not just because they were there, although I'm sure that was part of it, but the needy were recognizing that God was at work. The poor and the lame came to Jesus. The temple had been there a long time. They didn't just go to the temple to get healed. They went to Jesus. The kids just didn't start shouting praise randomly. They were shouting praise to Jesus. And the religious elite could not handle that. You know, you know another thought... When when we're looking at this, especially uh, about how indignant the religious elite were, the the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were at the kids, here in the 21st century, we have this idea that children are of very high value, and we lift them up, and and when we hear uh, announcements in church that a baby is on the way, everybody cheers, yay, this is great, and our nursery is growing, and all of this is wonderful. That is not how things were in Bible times. In Bible times, children had pretty much no social value. Maybe the oldest child would, okay, that one is going to inherit the birthright eventually. But for most of the times when they're squirreling little running around kids, they were not held in high value. That's why it was kind of so radical when Jesus originally said, let the little children come to me because there were a whole bunch of Adults around him who are like, shh, 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 don't, don't bug the master. Leave the rabbi alone. And Jesus is like, guys, it's fine. Come here. Children had zero value, zero status. So think about this. When the lowest of the low children end up praising 
Jesus, the elite were offended because kids didn't have the right to say anything at the temple. But they sure were noisy. They still are. So when we have children's message and the kids are crawling around and not super focused and noisy or whatever, hallelujah, there are children here. There are seeds being planted. The work of God is happening. Might be slow, might be slower than we want, might not be as cultivated, but God is at work. And we're thankful. Finally, another reason for frustration, putting things, the the wrong things in God's place or refusing to credit the work of God around us. Uh, Let's look at verses 18 to 22. Jesus has left the city, so now he's coming back. Verse 18, early in the morning, he was on his way back to the city and he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it but except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to the mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. A foundation for frustration is not seeing expected results in your life. Not seeing expected results in your life. I know the plans I have for me, says me. I'm riffing because, by the way, there is a verse in the Bible that says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. That's in Jeremiah. I take that idea and I co-opt it and think, I've got this. I know what I'm going to do. I know how my plans are going to work. It's become a running joke in our family. I'll say, Jamie, I, I plan to do this. Fix a car. And she'll say, well, how long is that going to take? And I give her the number that I think, in fact, what I, what I actually do is I have in my mind an idea. I think it's going to take this number. I multiply that number by four, and I give it to her. She takes that number and ignores it, probably multiplies that number by two or three, and then, real, okay, so if Ed thinks this is going to take an hour, it's going to be four hours, when I think it's actually going to be 15 minutes. The problem is I'm never sufficiently pessimistic. I forget that I'm living in a universe that is winding down. The second law of thermodynamics says that everything is slowing down. Entropy is happening. And I I hardly ever remember to account for that. And then I I pat myself on the back by, well, it's actually going to, I think it's going to take this long. So I will tell her it's going to take four times as long, thinking I'm being clever. I'm still not pessimistic enough because something will come up or I'll get a phone call or I won't have a tool or I'll have a tool, but I, I know I can't, I know I own that tool, but I can't find that tool. And then I have a war between my inner Scotsman and my inner German. The inner German, the engineer, wants to fix the thing, and the inner Scotsman says, you can't spend money on a new tool. You have the other one. You have to find it. And my inner slob says, I'm not cleaning that up. (laughs) That was your guys' job. I'm fine. So I do not see expected results. In, In 18 and 19, Jesus had a specific result in his mind. He sees a fig tree. It's reasonable to assume that a fig tree would have figs on it. He goes up to it and sees only leaves. A little piece of theology here. A little piece. We understand by faith from Scripture that Jesus is fully God and fully man at the same time. Yes? Okay. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus didn't consider equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he let it go. 
taking on the form of a servant. So this is how Jesus doesn't know in advance that there are figs or not on the tree. He's got to walk up to it and find out just like anybody else. Now, please don't misunderstand this. It's not that we should all have signs outside on the side of the road that says, God hates figs. That's not what's going on at all. I suppose you might be able to make a a biblical sign that says God hates the absence of figs because they're not there, and he wants them to be there. He's frustrated when it isn't. And verses 20 and 21, the disciples see him curse the tree, and their response is amazement because the disciples are focused on the procedure. How did you do that? And Jesus is concerned about the potential. Guys, fig trees are supposed to bear fruit. And they're not the only things that are supposed to bear fruit. Hint, hint, hint. So how do we deal with frustration in not seeing expected results or refusing to credit the work of God or putting the wrong things in God's place? There's two wonderful things to think about. One is from verse 22 here, and one is from the Habakkuk section that we read. Verse 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. The Habakkuk verse, especially verse 18. In fact, I'm going to go back and make sure I read that correctly. Habakkuk 3.18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Verse 17, in fact, much of the whole book of Habakkuk, the, the prophet is concerned that things are not going well. They're not going the way he expects them to go. And yet his choice is, I will praise God. I will choose Joy. I will choose to praise God. Even when I'm frustrated, even when I don't think it's going this way, I will choose joy. I can respond like that. Sometimes I have to choose joy over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because maybe it it doesn't seem to be sticking. I had a friend whose daughter wanted to get married yesterday and I opened my big fat mouth and said, well, I'll do it. And then found out after I had volunteered that she was going to be getting married on the other side of the state. I was thinking it was going to be another church wedding. Nope. But that's okay. Frankly, I got in the car early in the morning. I put on some of my favorite Christian music. I turned it way up, and I drove and sang at the top of my lungs for hours. It was a great day. Got there, did the wedding, wasn't tremendously long, Uh, needed to get back home because I knew I had to be here, started the car up, turned the music up, pointed the car back home, sang all the way home. It was a great day. I chose joy. We can do that. And it doesn't have to be Christian music. That just happens to be the thing that works well for me. Although I was given a truck last week and I found that I'm much more interested in country music now than I ever have been, so I didn't know what that was about. (laughs) The other thing is from here in verse 22 is talking about prayer. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I think there's three things that this kind of prayer requires. I'm just going to give them to you pretty quick and then we'll be done. The first one is the recognition of God. Because this isn't just speaking into the universe, thinking that if I just uh, announce the law of attraction, things will come to me. Hogwash. This is prayer. You are asking God. God, hear my prayer. This is what I'm concerned about. So there's a recognition of God. There's a reception of God's faith. You are believing in faith. And the faith isn't something that you generate. God gives us the faith wholesale. Ephesians 2, 8. We were looking at this in the adult Sunday school class today. God gives us faith. We don't generate it. 
So we talk to God. We use the faith that God gives us. And so recognition, reception, and the, the last one is another R. It's a release of mistrust. A release of mistrust. So here's what I mean. Frankly, this morning, I woke up really early because I was just really wound up about this morning. It's national, back to church Sunday. What if nobody shows? What if nobody shows up? Then I'll feel like I've failed. What if a whole bunch of people show up and I'm not prepared for it? Then I'll feel like I've failed. And I struggled with mistrust over this very service. And I had to look at, okay, let's, let's work through this. Is God less good today than he was yesterday? Nope, nope, God's always good. All the time God is good, God is good all the time. God doesn't change. Is God less worth trusting today than he was yesterday? Nope, same thing is true, God doesn't change. So the issue can't be with God. God it hasn't changed. It's me. So why was I so freaked out? Because I wasn't looking at God's part of the equation. I was only looking at my stuff. And my stuff was based out of fear. When an angel shows up, what's the first thing an angel says to a human? Don't fear. So, fear not. Well, maybe if they didn't show up at, you know, nine feet tall and flaming or whatever. We, but either way, the first thing the angel says is fear not. It's a reminder that I need. I'm assuming it's a reminder that you need. When we pray, we pray shared prayers. In the times when I personally, Ed, your, your pastor, when I feel shaky, if I try to face this on my own, I, I still stay shaky. But when I share this with my brothers and sisters in faith, when we work as a congregation, all of a sudden there's much more stability. I could choose joy. I can share my prayers and in doing so, I'm letting go of my own agenda. And with everything in me, like my dog, <laughs> shout joy to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I, I just, I thank you for the example of my dog, who is frankly a better Christian than I ever will be, because he always loves, and he's always excited. Um, he's filled with zeal, and is willing to let everybody know it. So Lord, for the times when I'm frustrated because I don't think I'm as far along as I should be, remind me. Trust. To, to trust you. To choose joy. To pray and give it all over to you because you're the one who is responsible for bringing the fruit about in my life anyway. I can be obedient and I can plant the seeds, but you're the one who causes them to grow. So do that, Lord. In this place, in this congregation, in this community, and in our lives personally. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.